for a glorious day in which you've given to us. Father, the last few days have been very nice and pleasant. Thank you, Father. We thank you for the changing seasons, which reminds us that you're in control, that you know exactly what you're doing, and that we, in comparison to you, are just finite. We are born a few days and full of trouble. You're infinite. You see the bigger picture. Father, we we trust that is true because we don't completely understand why you sent your only begotten son into the world, full of grace and truth. But we treated him spitefully. We hated him. In fact, we thought he deserved more than he got. But Father, you wouldn't have any part of him being guilty of anything except that he took our sin. He took our punishment. He took our chastisement. And he was willing to do it over and over again if need be. But he did it once. He's going to appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Father, we thank you for the salvation that comes through the giving of your son Jesus and how he was willing to go to that cross. And as we think about his broken body at this part of the Lord's Supper, he said, this do in remembrance of me because the body was broken for us. May we do that, Father, and it's in Jesus we pray. 
Amen. Father, we thank and continue our thanks because Jesus took the cup after supper saying, drink from this, all of you, this do in remembrance of me and he will not drink it again until the kingdom is living eternally in heaven. Yes, our citizenship is in heaven. No, there's not a future kingdom for it exists. But we know that we will be there one day if we are found faithful to you. None of that's possible, Father, without the body and the blood of Jesus. We thank you and we pray that we will do this in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 1 this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. And the title of this is very, very much apropos. This is serious business. We have learned from history that people don't always take things too seriously. They should take things more seriously. For example, when there was warnings given for storm warnings. I can remember growing up and when people didn't listen, they got hurt seriously. Well, Paul is going to give us 
a serious, serious warning that is still for us today. And it shocked Paul what happened at the church of Galatia. 19, and the, the, I'm sorry, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there's some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we've preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. In a joint session of Congress, May 25th, 1961, in the middle of the space race, in the middle of the arms race with the Soviet Union, what we called the Cold War, President John F. Kennedy promised that by the end of the century, that is the end of the decade, 1969, that the United States would put a man on the moon. You see, what we got scared about was about three to five years before that, the Soviets had put someone in space, which changed the whole complexion of the space race or the arms race, because now somebody had the capability to go to space and to attack the United States. We evened the odds when we went to the moon, and yet we still were in fear of the Soviet Union attacking us. And so the first civilian trained astronaut was named Neil Armstrong. He was the first man on the moon, and he was an American. The reason that's important is because we won up the Soviet Union. And when it was reported what Neil Armstrong said, and it's kind of hard to hear on the audio, Neil Armstrong was reported to have said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. When Neil Armstrong came back and in the middle of interviews that, that people said that they really didn't go to the moon, that he and Buzz Aldrin weren't stepping around and stepping on the moon and, and all. He said in the middle of one part of that interview, I never said that's one small step for man. He said, I said, that is one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Now, the problem is, is that when Neil Armstrong said what he said, we didn't receive it very well. I'm amazed that the technology that was available in the 1960s was able to go 238,000 miles to the moon and was still able to go farther than that today. The capabilities we have today, we are still talking to Voyager who's going out to the other part of the universe. And it takes two and a half weeks now to get a message to Voyager. It takes two and a half weeks to get it back. And yet we've got the Mars Rover. We've got, we've got all of these things out there in space. We've got enough space junk that I don't know how in the world they figure out what to do with it or where to put it or how to keep it from hitting people. It's amazing the technology that we have. And so you would think that even in the 1960s, we wouldn't have the same problem that the Galatians were having. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you received, let him be a curse, for now do I persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. There's a gospel that's being preached. This gospel has to get it right. Now, the gospel itself is correct. But as Paul said, there are some that want to pervert this gospel. There's 
an individual. We called him last week in our lesson, chapter 5 and verse 8 of 1 Peter, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And one of the ways he does it is he preaches a false gospel. He preaches a gospel that sounds just right. It sounds close enough to it. But when you look at the scriptures, you expose the problem. You find out that the problem is not in the book. It's in what somebody is preaching. In fact, look again. I marvel that you're turning away so soon who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. These are the Judaizing teachers. These are the ones who would go around stating that Jesus was just a lunatic, that he was a legend, but he was a liar. He was not who he claimed to be. In fact, we're still waiting for the Messiah. We're still waiting for the promised one. And this thing called a church should be done away with because what we should do is go back to the old law. Now, I have a question for you. Do you have a turtle dove and two young pigeons? Do you have grain? Do you have the forgiveness of sins. Well, if you have the forgiveness of sins, you appreciate the new law because you see, you never had the forgiveness of sins. Never, never, never. Hebrews chapter 10, verses one to four. You never had the forgiveness of sins, but you had a reminder of sins. How would you love it if you went to the church and you worshiped and the preacher got up there and said, I just want you to know you're all sinners. You're going to stay sinners. I'm a sinner, and I'll never be forgiven, and we're all going to hell. That was the old law. But at the right time, Paul said in Galatians 4.4, at the right time, he sent Jesus to redeem those under the law to be the curse for them. And Galatians 3.13 says, anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. And he removed that curse for us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The warning is accursed here. Now, accursed comes from the Greek word anathema. And the word anathema is that it's got the potential to be a sacrifice. It's got the potential to be pleasing to God, but it won't do it. Thus, it is excommunicated, or as we would say, it's going straight to hell. If anyone comes and preaches another gospel, if anyone preaches false doctrine, then they are going to hell. Now, that just almost sounds like, wait a minute. Are you on a soapbox about people going to hell? I'm always on a soapbox about people going to hell. I don't want anybody to go. But in our tolerant society, and to a point I appreciate our tolerant society, what we've lost fact of is there's still truth. Epimenides was a philosopher who told one of my favorite paradoxes. Epimenides' paradox says there's no truth, but there's no truth in that. There's no truth, but there's no truth in that. And there have been philosophers down through the ages, and I like philosophy. I don't agree with a lot of it, but I like it. For example, did not Nietzsche tell us years ago, God is dead? And about 10 years ago, there was a movie that says God is not dead. Well, Frederick Nietzsche knows God's not dead. But this warning is a stern warning. It is just as though we're on the edge of death. We have the opportunity to stop it. And what are we going to do? That's why the Bible says, even if we are an angel from heaven, preach 
any other gospel to you than what we preach to you, let him be accursed. I've talked to people about this, this subject, and, and they'll go, well, I, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, if, if anybody wants to preach, they can preach whatever they want. Is that what Paul said? Is that what God in, or the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write here? In fact, James chapter 3, verse 1 tells us, let not many of you become teachers because we're going to receive a stricter judgment. And anybody that's been teaching in the public school, like Jan and me, anybody that's been teaching in the public knows that when you get something wrong, you're scrutinized more than the student is. Well, we should be scrutinized. Now, let's clear up something real quick before we leave this point. When James says, let not many of you become teachers knowing we're going to receive a stricter judgment, is he contradicting his half-brother Jesus? When Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. No. But it was like a three-ring circus to whom James was writing. The idea of worship service was self-centered. In other words, when, when I got up to preach, I criticized everybody there. I condemned everybody there. I made sure that the name was known, and then the next week it was their turn to condemn me. It was their turn to criticize me. And James would, would say in chapter 3, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. So we got to be careful what we preach. In fact, I am always nervous. I've done this for about 33 years, part-time and, and full-time. I even done it in substituting uh, since I was 16. And I still, to this day, get very nervous about what I preach. Not because the book is wrong, but because I'm human, sometimes I get things wrong. Now, I don't do it intentionally. And I get usually point out when I do it wrong. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. There was a young man who had become a Christian. He hadn't been a Christian very long. And he was reading about Paul and Timothy's relationship in the Lord. Well, he read where Paul said, Timothy, my son. Well, not having all of the tools that he needed. And he was really trying to, and, and he was sincere in his Christian walk. He got up there and said that a very sweet Christian sister took him aside and showed him in Acts 16 that Timothy was a half Jew. His father was Greek. And that because of all of the arguments that the, that the Jewish leaders would make, he had to be circumcised even though physical circumcision avails nothing. And so he got up and he apologized to everybody at the next time he spoke. And everybody said, well, we, we knew what you meant and, we, and you meant well. Now that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is being very careful about preaching the truth. Here's why. Because number two, the gospel received Everyone today is receiving some type of gospel. The word gospel means good news. Do we not like good news? Do we not like it when somebody has a birthday and we'll see it on Facebook and we'll tell them happy birthday? Or somebody has a baby and we'll, we'll they'll, uh, for example, the, the guy I'm, the guy's got the same birthday as I do. He had another, another baby the other day. Congratulations. Wonderful. We like that kind of news. But look at what Paul said here in verse nine. We got to be real careful as to what we receive. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. I have a friend who is having some heart issues. Well, she keeps putting off going to the doctor, or she keeps rescheduling her appointments. But you know what her real problem is? Her real problem is, is that she sits at her desk, and she snacks on candy, 
and candy bars and that type of thing. Now, personally, I don't like candy. I may have an occasional peppermint or something like that. And I really don't have any room to talk because of my weight. But the thing is, if she wants to feel better and if she wants to help her heart, she's got to stop snacking like that. Now, that's hard when you get into the habit. What are you receiving? One guy used to say, I haven't had a thing to eat all day. What he really meant was he didn't have a meal. He'd been snacking on pepper, a peanut brittle, and he'd been snacking on other things all day. Well, can you imagine the, that some of these parents that are, the, are immigrants, they're, the, what they're doing is they're telling their children, I'll be right back, and they leave them? I can't imagine a parent doing that to their child. Now, I, I understand I'm not an immigrant, but, but I can't imagine telling my children I'll be right back and never seeing them again. What are we receiving? One of my favorite memories of growing up, especially when we lived in the country, was listening to AM radio. Now, you couldn't get it very well. It was really scratchy. There were some stations that we got better than others. There was a station in Denver. There was WBAP in Fort Worth. There, were, there was other stations, KOK, KOMA, uh, that, that we could get. But you'd have to really fine tune that radio. And I can remember that we, we'd get some Hispanic stations and they'd be speaking Spanish. And, and I had a Hispanic friend and, and I, I'd tell him, I'd ask him, what are they trying to say? And he'd say, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> but you had to really tune that in. That's what we should be doing with the word of God. Because a lot of, there's a lot of talk out there. There's a lot of noise out there. When I moved here 31 years ago, you couldn't even, you could turn the television on and maybe you could get some type of religious programming on Sunday. Now we got Daystar. We've got Inspiration Network. We've got all these other, other things going, but be real careful what you hear. Be careful what you hear. Because if you receive the wrong information and you act upon it, it could lead to eternal destruction. You see that there are some people that receive it like an FM radio. Man, when we got FM radio, oh my goodness gracious, you didn't have to, to tune in exactly. You could still listen to it, but it had a little static in it. And then when we got digital, oh my goodness, analog was, was out and you got digital. You couldn't go back and forth away from the, the uh, frequency. And now we have FN, Sirius XM. In fact, uh, I don't know if we would even be happy taking out or if we, they didn't take out the FM and the AM out of our cars. Because now we have, we have a satellite, and it exactly gives us what we want to hear. Usually my radio is tuned to the 80s, Channel 8. But we know when the 80s music is on that that's 80s music. Now, there's been a time or two when they'll play a song in the eight, uh, from 80s, and you're like, wait a minute, that wasn't the 80s. That was the late 70s, or that was the early 90s. Then you look down there and it's 92. It's got to be exact. Paul said, if we, if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than what you've received, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him be excommunicated. Let him go to hell. Now, when Paul wrote that, Paul wasn't trying to get people to go to hell. He was trying to get them to go to heaven. In fact, he planted the church of Galatia. And when he planted the church of Galatia, he very much wants them to go home. This Paul is the man 
of whom the Jews relied on to get rid of the Lord's church until Acts chapter 9. He went to Damascus with letters to arrest Jewish women and, and men who were Christians. That's the only Christians we had at the time. And he was going to bring them back to Jerusalem, give them what I call a monkey trial. And then he was going to stand by or he was going to part participate in their stoning to death. He wreaked havoc of the church, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. He breathed threatenings and slaughterings, Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Well, you started Acts chapter 9. I'm sorry, I said Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Acts chapter 9 verse 1, he breathed threatenings and slaughterings. You start there, and by the time you get to the end of Acts chapter 9, they want to kill Paul because he's now preaching Jesus, and he's proving three Sabbaths, according to the Thessalonians church, three Sabbaths, he, three weeks he planted the church at Thessalonica or Thessalonia because he knew the truth. And what did he say in, for, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7 and 8? I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I finished the race. Now, therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, but not only to me, but to all of those who've loved his appearing. You see, here's what the problem is. Do I persuade men or God? <laughs> You're going to have a hard, hard time. In fact, let me tell you, you have an impossible time convincing God that his word's wrong. Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I wouldn't be a, a slave of Jesus Christ. That word bondservant comes from the Greek word doulos, and it literally means a slave. The gospel has nothing to do with pleasing people. Oh, how I wish that people were pleased that the gospel was preached. The gospel has nothing to do with persuading God. God doesn't need persuading. He wrote it. And the gospel has everything to do with whom we're enslaved. Paul said to the Roman brethren in Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading more on lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, for holiness. And he continues into verse 20, he said, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what fruit then did you have in the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I work in one industry besides school and preaching, and people tell me, are you crazy? You work in a funeral home? You work for funeral homes? And I'm like, yes, my mother and dad used to call me morbid because I always, one of my three aspirations in life was to be a funeral director. I understand what they meant. Don't think I'm being uh, uh, anti-parents or anti-people because death scares people. I had a fire chief here in Bayard one day and he's just yelling at me and another guy who was a full-fledged funeral director and he couldn't figure out how in the world we were able to work with dead people. And I finally went like this to him. And he said, what, Springer? And I said, you know what? I don't know how you work on the live ones. Hires don't fight back. I thought the full-fledged funeral director was going to fall on the ground laughing. The guy said, oh, shut up, Springer. You're just a smart aleck. Well, I might have been a smart aleck. I've done that before. But you see, death scares people. And the reason death scares people is most people don't know what death really is. Death is separation. Death is separation from God. 
You see, when those parents tell those kids down on the, on the border, I'll be right back, they died. Oh, they didn't die physically, but they separated themselves from their children. God doesn't want that, folks. God does not want us to be separated from him. He wants us to have eternal life. And the only way we can have eternal life is by this book right here. And so I'm real careful as to what I preach. I hope you're careful at what you receive because it's easy for us. It's easy for us to say, well, they go to a different church or they go to a different, they preach a different thing. And so I'm not going to listen to it and I'm not going to put up with it. Well, that, that, that's commendable if it doesn't agree with the Bible. But how are you as a Christian going to be able to defend the truth against some of those teachings? How are you going to do that? For example, I, I hear all the time people talk about the, the, uh, the rapture. You'd be amazed and, and, uh, and be stupefied as to people that don't know what the rapture really is. But what they've done now is they've put the rapture and attached it to the judgment day. The judgment day will happen, but the rapture will never happen. There is nothing in the scriptures that teach it. In fact, if the rapture were true, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 to 26 would say this. It would say, first, those at Christ at his coming, Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. No, if the rapture were true, everybody would be that's a Christian would be going to Jesus in heaven. All of those who are sinners will kill themselves, will, will have a total annihilation. It'll be a holocaust of epic proportion. And when all of those who are sinners and all of those who didn't do what God said, then God will bring them back, recreate the interior of the world, and we'll live off the fig trees of the world for a thousand years. Look, if we're finicky now as to what we eat, why would we want to live off the fig trees of the world for a thousand years? Oh, I know what people do. It sounds good. That sounds close. But we've got to be very careful as to what we preach and be very careful as to what we receive. Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Whoa! Wow.